Based on current surveys of public opinion in the United States, it turns out that the majority of Americans think I've done a pretty good job. There have been a few times this past week when uh, all I wanted to do was just to curl up with a good book or our dogs and never leave the house again. People that are criminal and have criminal records, gang members, drug dealers, we're getting them out of our country or we're going to incarcerate. Freedom is back in style. Welcome to the revolution. We burning down the night, shooting bullets at the moon, baby, this is how we roll. Whoa, 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 whoa. Sean Hannity. The new, the new Sean Hannity Show. More behind-the-scenes information on breaking news and more bold, inspired solutions for America. Based on current surveys of public opinion in the United States, uh, it turns out that the majority of Americans think I've done a pretty good job. Uh, that we haven't, in fact, gone too fast, uh, as you describe it. Uh, but what is certainly true is that the American people, just like the German people, just like the British and people around the world, are seeing extraordinarily rapid change. The world is shrinking, economies have become much more integrated, and demographics are shifting. Because of the Internet and communications, the clash of cultures is much more direct. People feel, uh, I think, less certain about their identity, less certain about economic security. They're looking for some means of control. And uh, what that means is, is that uh, the politics in all of our countries is, is going to require us to manage technology and global integration and all these demographic shifts uh, in a way that makes people feel more control, that gives them more confidence in their future, uh, but does not resort to simplistic answers or divisions of race or tribe or, or a crude nationalism, which I think can be contrasted to the pride and patriotism that we all feel about our respective countries. Um, and you know, I think that our politics everywhere uh, are going to be going through this bumpy face. I'm really great. I really, I'm so good. I'm so great. You know, let, let's let forget some mere facts. You know, why let facts get in the way of a, of a good old narrative, right? If you're, if you're Barack Obama, let's see, since uh, he's been president, 13 Senate seats went from blue to red. 64 House seats went from Democrat to Republican. 14 governorships went from Democrat to Republican. 30 entire state houses have gone from Democrat to Republican. And that doesn't even include my normal numbers. You know, 13 million more Americans on food stamps and 8 million more in poverty, 50 million in each category and 95 million Americans out of the labor force and the worst recovery since the 40s. But don't worry, Obama in his own brain thinks he did a great job. Well, maybe he thinks he did a good job in Libya or Iraq or Syria or that Russian reset. I don't know. We're here to tell us. Uh, who owes me a huge amount of money after, after the election, is Austin Goolsby. Now, before you claim, I didn't bet you, we have the tape, so so I want you to know you're about to be held accountable. Okay, play it. No, I don't have it with me. Oh, that, that, <laughs> the tape proves me right. No, there is the one. Tape, I, I, you I, said I, you had the tape. But listen to me. We made a bet. We had a dinner we, bet. I wanted to bet you all along. I, I said I dinner. Was take more of your money, and you wouldn't bet me. That's so not true. That is so. That's like you saying that the Obama economy is good. That's like you saying that Obama. No. That's like you saying that Obama has been really good on the debt and deficits. That's like Obama saying that he's a great president. You said yes. Let's bet. Finally, <laughs> I on did. The fourth try. I you did. Said, okay, let's do it. So and I thought it was said, the usual bet. We bet. I thought and it was the I usual said, bet. I paid off the last time. I took you and your yes, wife. You By the way, your wife was not included as part of the package of our bet, but I bought you her dinner anyway. One of the times. And by the way, did I get a cheap bottle of wine? Did I bring Boone's Farm? No, you had a classy bottle of wine. Okay, I got an expensive bottle of wine. I said anything on the menu at an expensive 
massive steakhouse and I took care of my... And on top of it, because you were whining so much, I even gave you a Ruth's Chris gift certificate on top of that. Okay, so now that's what I was going to say. I'm going to send you I think there's $8 <laughs> left on that Ruth's Chris card. <laughs> and I'm going to send you back that card. Wait a minute. You have $8. <laughs> Why didn't you give it to the waiter in a tip? <laughs> I said, Typical liberal doesn't want to does wants I everything did. for free and doesn't I want to give I a tip. Eat enough. I tried to eat everything. I gave a nice tip. There's still eight dollars on. There. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, anyway, how do you feel? You can't. You're not going to drink this Kool Aid and say that Obama is such a good president that his bad presidency, that the horrible economy we're in, that the horrible uh, state no, of world affairs. First of all, you need to did, update your numbers. Hang on. Did, I don't feel good, as you might imagine, because your man won the presidency. Uh-huh. In the opposite of a landslide, but he did win. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's, well, what's Obama, he up to, 306 he electoral votes and going higher? Than Ronald Reagan's was when he left office, so you better be a little careful. Excuse me, Ronald Reagan left after having created real total jobs, 20, 21 million new jobs, the longest peacetime uh, period of peacetime growth in economic history. He, excuse point. me. Excuse me. He's one of our greatest economic presidents. You can't say that about Obama when you have but 13. Why wasn't he more popular when he left office? Well, he actually was. I mean, if you look at even recent. No, Obama's popularity is above Reagan's at this point in his office. Well, let's see. Let's see how, how history serves President Obama. I guarantee you. Now, one of the reasons I would argue and we saw this in WikiLeaks, you even have to be upset at the fact that that the New York Times and Politico were allowing the Clinton campaign to sign off on any article they wrote. You've got to be upset that CNN was feeding questions to Hillary Clinton. You've got to be upset yeah, no, but those are two that CNN things. that CNN the, the feeding the questions that was that was pretty, that was pretty bad, right? That, that did not. That was not By the bad. way, Politico wrote an article about me today. They didn't give me they didn't even ask me a question. Never mind have editing authority. <laughs> Hey, hey, no, the, the, but on those others... By the way, you got to see my what? painting I bought. It's called The Forgotten Man, and Obama's in it. He's stepping on the Constitution. Oh, please. But now listen, if what happened, there was one of those cases that I was familiar with. As you know, it is normal to say when you're interviewing with someone, if you're on background, say, look... I'm going to say we're going to have an interview, and then when it's over, you we have, quote, approval. Republicans and Democrats do that all the time. That's different than saying you have say over what the person is writing in their article. So if what they were talking about is, quote, approval and making sure that what they said was correct and accurate, I have no problem with that. If what it was is, hey, will you write my story for me? I do have. Okay, a let me tell you what we know. We know that Donald Trump never got that opportunity. Oh, no, we don't not. Oh, know wait that. a minute. Hang on. We know. Well, WikiLeaks didn't show any example of them. Well, offer. but I mean, Breitbart has got uh, many examples. Breitbart. That Breitbart. Wait a minute. Other way. Well, don't, you have to give me a specific example because the New York Times was exposed. C- uh, uh, the Politico was exposed. CNBC was exposed. CNN is the worst. MSNBC. No, CNBC, NBC. That's a case that I know well. That was one which was about quote approval. Excuse Excuse me. No, CNBC was about John Harwood, who yeah, was John Harwood. John Harwood accurate. And, and can no. you clear this quote? John Harwood was giving advice to the campaign, as WikiLeaks pointed out, and he was bragging, ha ha ha, to the Clinton campaign that he got under Donald Trump's skin because he was colluding with the Clinton campaign. That's not. Uh, no, 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 stop. You can't, you can't friend, have it both Sean, ways. And, and you know that I will often say when you have a critique that is legit. I will often say, yes, that's fair. The, I think you're being a little unfair to Harwood. He, he, was, he was not colluding with or rooting for the Clinton campaign. That, that's okay, let me, let me tell you where you're wrong. Because if he's okay. going to moderate a debate and he's offering yeah. the campaign advice, which was proven, and he, is, uh, and, and he is bragging to the Clinton campaign, hey, I got under Donald Trump's skin, that is not a human being that is objective fair and balanced that's somebody that has an agenda which by the way i make my living having opinions but the difference between the difference and between a good living you make and then the difference between me and john harwood is i'm honest 
the difference between me and the New York Times. I'm upfront and honest. They are sneaky. They lie to their li- their viewers, their readers, their listeners. They're phony. They're corrupt. And journalism yeah, in America I, I is think, dead. I think you're going. I think you're going a little overboard in in this case because in the, I mean, which to say nothing. I don't. I don't get your. I see why you like finding out the information in WikiLeaks, but I don't know why you're not more upset about about Assange Obama's and economy. The and, and, and well, first Russian of all, there's bombing. no evidence. WikiLeaks, by the way, WikiLeaks has never been proven wrong in 11 years. Yeah. Excuse me. WikiLeaks I, has said this is not the Russians. Now. I know that's what they said. But, okay, well, uh, but, uh, give me one example. Our ex- own intelligence community does well, not Well, it's not 17, as Hillary said. It. No, 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 no. Let's no. say that they turn on President Trump and they start revealing a bunch of national secrets about President Trump and his administration. I think you're going to feel differently about let me their- Let me tell you how I feel. When this first started with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, my biggest fear was that innocent people were going to die as a result. Methods and yes. and yes. and people. Yes. All right. And well, well, that's a good. That's what you should. That's what my. Now, here's yeah. what I think we are missing with WikiLeaks. That is a good thing. Two things that I think we should benefit from WikiLeaks. Number one, it exposed that we have no cybersecurity. In a backhanded way, WikiLeaks has done us an enormous favor. And the favor is now America's on notice. At 16 years of age, Julian Assange was able to break into the Department of Defense and to NASA. So we don't have cybersecurity. And if you don't have cybersecurity, you're not a nation with secrets. So the good news is it's been exposed. We now have an opportunity to fix the problem. Issue number two, we discovered how deeply deeply corrupt what a liar and a phony and a fraud both hillary clinton is and the news media is i've been on radio now, now for 30 i've been hang on let me finish i've been I, on radio for 30 I, years I, I understand why you're happy with what information you gathered but but believe me the russians or whoever is supplying assange with the with the cyber power that he has gathered when they turn on trump and start releasing really detrimental information you're not going to be pleased and i'm not going to be pleased either even though i don't favor donald trump i don't like him i really do not like foreign entities going in and taking this the private messages from the U.S. government. So now that it's been now that it's Trump, been exposed, totally wrong. What are we going to do to fix it? Because at the end of the day, now that we know there's a problem, my answer is we better fix it. Yeah, I agree with that. So, and the second thing is, you know, we learned here that what I said back in, in 2008 when I was vetting and doing the media's job and vetting your buddy Obama. And exposing and ABC radio. uh, Excuse me. When I was vetting Obama at a level that nobody could even compete with, I'm the one that gave for the ABC radio. Okay, who gave George Stephanopoulos the question about Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn? Do you want to know who gave it to him? You you did. Yeah, I gave it to him right on my radio program. You know who followed up and asked about it? Who that guy on ABC radio, which is why you owe me money. That was what 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 guy on ABC radio? The guy Tom Joyner. Tom. Oh, you mean the guy that played after the girl? got bit by a shark and he was they they were singing a song biting whitey another shark bite yeah this this is (laughs) another shark bite this took place in hawaii this little girl is supposed to be a surfing champion (laughs) yeah 13 years old went out uh, with her best friend and her friend's father but she was lying on the board off of Kauai's North Shore. A shark bit once and oh, then disappeared. So they're, they're, they're laughing at an 11-year-old little girl, 10-year-old little girl. Uh, Stephanie Hamilton is her name. I'm well, sorry, Bethany Hamilton. I don't Hamilton. think the guy has, is that Excuse me. Excuse me. No, no, no. It's not a matter about bite. being fine. So we, you're, we, you're we, quoting we, a guy that sings racist songs as a legitimate news source. Is that, am I getting that accurate? The guy's in the Radio Hall of Fame. He's on ABC. I didn't radio. ask you. Is what he's you just is what you just show. heard? He's not Hannity. Excuse level. me. Is what he's one of the most is what you just heard? Programs in the country. You're not going to stop me from asking my question. Is what you just heard racist? I couldn't hear it. I was 
talking. I'll play it again. <laughs> well, no, let's yeah, play it again. This is about I a little eleven-year-old girl not and good. another shark bite. <laughs> yeah, this this is another the, shark bite. This took place in Hawaii. This another little girl is supposed to be bite. a surfing <laughs> champion. White. Yeah, so thirteen <laughs> years old went out uh, with yeah. her best friend and her bite friend's father, bite. but she was lying on the board yeah, off of Kauai's bite. North Shore. A shark bit yeah, once white. and then disappeared. Taking her left arm just below the shoulder. Wow. She said nobody saw it happen, but everybody heard her yell, a shark just bit me. Wow. If you inside of the building, stay out the water, white people, shark won't bite you. That's why it keeps on, keeps on biting white. I don't have time to play anymore. Is that racist, Austin? I don't think it was racist, but it was no? certainly in racially bad taste. Racially bad taste. An eleven-year-old girl had her arm bitten off by a shark, and they're making fun of it. And the shark is a, only bites white people. That's not racist. It was in no, their theme of but their the their theme jokes. of their jokes. Here's what white people. And that's do your that news source. Okay. All right. All right. I'm going to leave it there. The Austin sharks. Goolsby thinks that is a legitimate news source. Maybe we'll put it up on Hannity.com as a question. Do you think that show is a legitimate news source? Quick break. Right back. We'll continue. Hannity Headlines. A bite-sized version of the show that you can take with you everywhere you go. To sign up today for Hannity Headlines, go to Hannity.com. You are listening to the best of the Sean Hannity Show. More Hannity, less big government. This is the Sean Hannity Show. I just want to say thank you. You saved me in so many ways. In recent years, um, I've been struggling um, with an incurable illness, and I'm on home care now. It was caused by a doctor's medical negligence. And in those dark days, fighting, um, right now all the tubes have been removed, and I have a do not resuscitate order, and I have a seven-year-old son. In those days in the hospital, I received from you a handwritten letter that said to the bravest woman I know. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. And you, um... Such a wonderful, beautiful woman. I mean, just an amazing woman. And are you, are you doing, are you coming along okay? Um, um no, sir. But, um, that's okay, because I'm here right now to thank you in person, and that was my biggest dream. And I wanted to thank you, because... Through you and your organizations, my son, who is Mexican-American, seven years old, through your organizations, and just being able to stand on that stage with you back in 2005, the outpouring of love that came from that um, ultimately provided my son, when he graduates high school, with a, um, a full ride to college. And that was That's great. And you know what we'll do? We're going to watch him. You're going to watch him, Tanner. Tanner, watch him. We're going to be watching your boy, okay? But you're going to hopefully be around. You're not going to have to have anybody watching. You're going to hopefully be around. Those doctors are going to be so wrong. But we'll be helping you. All right, you may remember that. By the way, 25 till the top of the hour, 800-941-SEAN. That was Melissa Young. Um, I actually become friends with her. And she... I just talked to her, I guess it was when the night that Trump won, she sent me some really cool pictures, and I checked in with her, and she made it to New York, and she had said it to me at the time that her dream was to live long enough to see Donald Trump get elected. Remember, she was one of the women, if you, if you think back, she was a former Miss Wisconsin, and she was one of the women that came out and said, you know, stop slamming, smearing Donald Trump like Carrie Prejean and so many others, I can't list all their names, but they were coming out saying no. This man helped us. This man was kind to us. This man is not uh, Rowan Brewer. Lane was another. There were so many women that came out and said, no, what this, this, this is a lie, what they're saying about Donald Trump. And I would say it probably had a very big impact on this election. So she made it. She said her dream was to live long enough to see Donald Trump get elected. Now, what the public doesn't know is that Donald Trump is the one that put made her a promise to send her son to college when he's of age. I think her son is, what, eight? And uh, so she's been struggling with this really difficult autoimmune disease of hers, and it's impacted her heart, and basically she has the heart of a 90-year-old woman. Now, sadly, since Election Day last week, she has taken a very significant turn for the worse, and um, 
two of her friends are with us to update us on her condition. And uh, more importantly, we just wanted to send words of love out to her today. And then we'll get to your calls here in a minute. Uh, Chelsea Cooley is with us. And uh, by the way, Chelsea is a uh, former Miss USA 2005. Rose Tennant, we all know from the host of the Rose Unplugged radio show. Uh, welcome both of you. Rose, what's going on? She took a bad turn, I hear. Yeah, she did. And I have to tell you that thanks to you, I got to be friends with Melissa as well. As a matter of fact, when you spoke with her election night, I was able to secure a ticket for her by working with Ashley at the Trump headquarters in New York. And afterwards, she and your Lauren and I stayed up till 530 in the morning. She was so thrilled to be a part of that, Sean. She really was. This is one of the most beautiful women I've ever met in my life, inside and out. And the thing is, when people look at her, she's so beautiful, even now as she's dying, that they can't believe she's as sick as she is. But she is sick, Sean. And when I think about those words that Mr. Trump spoke, we're going to be watching your boy, I think that's a mandate for all of us. I think all of us and your listeners, we need to be watching her boy. And because she's taken a worse, and there's some other things that have happened to her since election night. As a matter of fact, one of these things did happen election night. Um, I, I think we all need to be... Uh, guidance and protectors of melissa young and her son and there's and there's ways we can do it and i know chelsea's on hi chelsea how are you hey i'm great how are y'all doing it's amazing by the way i gotta give all of you credit and i know that a whole bunch of you really have offered her such incredible support and uh and chelsea thanks for all that you've been doing to help her and uh, but things aren't looking very good at all well you know melissa and i met on the Miss USA stage and obviously I won and she got married and our lives took two totally different turns and when we reconnected several years ago and I found out about everything that was going on with her medically you know being in North Carolina I felt like I was a million miles away and so God brought us back together in the most beautiful way Um, I am her medical power of attorney now but she is she's like my sister she's my best friend so what happened somebody broke into her house as well on election yes. night. So ever since she spoke out in March, she's received, of course, a lot of wonderful messages, but she's received a lot of hate mail. And so on election night, someone actually tried to break in unsuccessfully, nonetheless. But then early um, Sunday morning, it was actually she and I had been on the phone for a while late Saturday night. And within minutes of hanging up from her, they tried again, a second attempt to break in. They were unsuccessful in breaking in, but they did steal her family's car, and they did leave evidence that they would return and and possibly try to harm her. And, you know, just to paint the picture for you, Sean, you know, here is a mother that's laying in bed. She's hooked up to IVs, especially at night, where she can get hydration and nutrition through her line. And so when you're having to unplug from IVs, it is not a simple, quick procedure. There's a lot of things that go into place with that. And so here she is frantically trying to break loose, rush into her son's room to make sure that he is okay. All she could do is cover him with her body until the police got there. She was terrified. And now she's living in fear amongst the worst possible circumstances. Well, I'll tell you the first thing that I'm, I'm going to do. I, I'm going to call my friends at Simply Safe Home Security, and uh, we'll send over a complete system for her, everything she'll need to keep her family safe. So we'll do that first and foremost. And uh, I guess, you know, Rose, I mean, I hate to say that, you know, I had such a personal, private conversation about life and death with her. Yeah, that that she too. and I, she made me a promise. I can't say it on the air. Okay. But we had a very personal, very private conversation. And uh, and she basically told me she knew that she wasn't going to make it. Yeah. And yeah. so I said something to her and she said something to me that I will forever remember for the rest of my life. She was incredible. Um, but let's get her the protection she needs. Is there yeah. any anything we can do to help her family? Is I, she financially I, okay? I think that we should donate. Chelsea set up a fund for her, and I think we should be donating. And I think that we need to pray for her and her family. She told me today that the only thing that God has left her with is her voice. And she's been using that voice as weak as it is sometimes, Sean. She uses it for a strong message. And right now she's just asking people, look, you know, we need to come together as a nation. And the truth is, and and Chelsea and I talked about this earlier, Melissa was telling us both that, that everybody has a mom. And whether you're on the left or the right, whether you voted or didn't, how would you feel if your mother, at the end of her life, a mother who only wants to spend her last days with her child, was being terrorized? I mean, how can you attempt to rob that mother, not just of her car, but of those final days spent with the very one that she loved so desperately? 
So I'm asking for prayers, too, for her. And I definitely think we should all reach out and send whatever we can, whether it's $5 or $500. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that God will put that to good use. All right, use. so I'll tell you what we're going to do. We'll put this up, and, and I'm going to donate right off the top 10000 to get it going. Oh, my God. And, Linda, you, oh you, you put that in the uh, – you make sure you put it in a GoFundMe account. You know who to write. And you know, look, I'm not asking for people to put a lot of money in here. If you put no. if you put fifty bucks, twenty bucks, a hundred bucks, if you can do it, you know, this kid's eight years old. He's got a he's got a long life to live. And imagine if it was your child, it would be very very difficult. And she went out on a limb, sick as a dog, to huh. to fight for Donald Trump in this election. Um, yeah. I'm going to call Mr. Trump later, and I'll make sure he gets word of her condition Good. and uh, and see if he can get in t- contact with her. But, you know, and actually, Melissa, this breaks. You know, I just yeah. I, I, I appreciate it more than you will ever know. You know, when Melissa had the courage to, to speak up about her message about Mr. Trump, you know, and just about the man that he is and the man that she and I both know him to be, it wasn't about politics. It was about her personal story with him, and she needed mm-hmm. peace before she goes to heaven to know that she could properly thank him for all that he has done in her life. And it was a message to show her son that until your last breath, it doesn't matter if you have to army crawl your way there, it's worth standing up for what's right and for the people that have done right by you. And so, you know, pushing all politics aside, this was a personal human story of the heart. And and so, you know, the biggest thing that she wants to get across to everyone right now is that enough is enough, you know, Everybody is hurting each other all because we disagree on something. And we have to come together now in love and respect for one another and move forward. And so that is her prayer for us as a nation. And um, she's just so indebted to you, Sean, and thanks the world of you. So thank you so much for just shedding light on the story and, and for continuing to show your support for her. Yes, all right, guys, Sean. thank you both for being with us. Thank and, uh, you. We really thank appreciate you, it. And she's in our prayers. Melissa Young, we'll put that up on our website. She's got an 8-year-old little boy. And uh, if you can give, I know everybody's struggling. I, I, I have gone out of my way. I'm not, I don't ask people to spend money anymore. You know, what's one of the reasons we don't do concerts? Because people can't afford this anymore. That's how bad this Obama economy has been. But, you know, maybe in the spirit of Thanksgiving, Christmas, you can give a little bit. Uh, it's on my website. I'm, I'm going to lead by example. I don't care if it's $10, $5. It's whatever you can. It's uh, it's an eight-year-old boy that's got to grow up. Uh, all right, let's get to our busy uh, telephones as we say hi to Ted is in Dover, Delaware. Ted, how are you, sir? Welcome to the Sean Hannity Show. Hey, how you doing, Sean? It's been a while. Boy, this has been one heck of uh, election year. First of all, my prayers go out to the family. And first of all, I want to say you're a real class act, man. Thanks, brother. Thanks, my friend. God bless you. Listen, aren't you happy? Don't you feel a sense of, you know, and it's not, by the way, arrogant happy. It's not, oh, we won, you lost, na 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 happy. It's not that for me. It's, you know, I just feel happy that I really feel we've got a shot at correcting well, what has gone so wrong in this country and, and getting people opportunity and, and, and hope back. Well, you've been vindicated. And like I said, if anybody hasn't told you, you took a lot of arrows in, in the last eight years. All I can say, man, is personally thank you for being our voice. I'm gonna tell you, man, it got so frustrated I couldn't listen to the radio, but I had to pick it up. Oh, thank you. you. were telling us the truth. You kept, I mean, you kept, you kept me going. Remember what you said: let your heart not be troubled, brother. I was putting it all on you, man. But let me tell you something: we <laughs> came through, and like you said, we're not doing no uh, end zone, end zone dance. We got a lot of work to do. No, I agree. It's you've, a... been, you've been vindicated. You've been vindicated for the last eight years. You've been um, ringing the bell, you know, the morning bells. It's funny you say, I'll tell you the one thing the media never got, the statistics that I repeated again and again and again. Who was I talking about? The people in poverty on food stamps out of the labor force that can't buy a house that that haven't felt any benefit because there's no recovery, the worst recovery since the 40s. That is the forgotten men and women of this country Mm -hmm. that went out in droves saying we want jobs. We want hope. We want opportunity. We want, you know, get government off our freaking back because you're it, the yes. burden is killing us. Anyway, thank you, Ted. All right, buddy. Appreciate it. God bless you. And uh, Rich is in Chicago, the Windy City, where Ram Rombo Deadfish, your mayor, who, by the way, has presided over oh, last. But well, since Obama's been president, well, four thousand around four thousand people in Chicago killed vast majority black American. And this year alone, over 3,000 people in Chicago shot. What a great track record, Rom Rombo Deadfish. Oh, and he says yeah, he's going to. 
<laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah, and he's going he's gonna to always keep his city a sanctuary city and violate the law. So maybe we can take him out in handcuffs and put him in the pokey. That would be, that yeah. would be a beautiful sight and a justice, a sign of justice in this country, finally. Yeah. I only um, got about 40 thanks, seconds. Thanks. It's all yours, though. What's on your mind? Okay. So uh, earlier you played a, a clip from President Obama in Greece. And it sounded like a classic example of what we call in the, uh, I'm a therapist, so what we call in the mental health uh, community as a poli a impulse, or it's, it's like when a, a large group of people are like uh, hypnotized by an enigmatic person like Obama or like Hitler or like Mao or like whoever. And they all had this delusional belief, this world belief, that it has to be this way. It can be no other way. They're, like, stuck in this mindset, liberalism, that they just can't get out of. And if it's, like, what just happened, this, I wouldn't say shattering, yeah, I guess maybe fracturing of the reality, they're having this neural meltdown. You know, and you're really that? hitting on something that I believe in. And I wish I had more time to analyze this with you. Would you call us back next week, because I'm off tomorrow, and... I would love to get into this deeper with you because Democrats, they're susceptible to lies. That's why Democratic leaders say Republicans are racist, sexist, homophobic, Islamophobic, xenophobic every election season. It's all predicated on a lie. And that's why Obama, Hope and Chain, people bought into rhetoric lies in the hopes that their lives would get better. It never happened. It never, never became reality. And when we get back, we've got so much to get to today. Uh, we've got Joel Pollack is going to join us. The assassination of one's character now going on by the left. In this case, it's Steve Bannon. We'll talk about that and more as we continue. Based on current surveys of public opinion in the United States, it turns out that the majority of Americans think I've done a pretty good job. There have been a few times this past week when uh, all I wanted to do was just to curl up with a good book or our dogs and never leave the house again. People that are criminal and have criminal records, gang members, drug dealers, and we're getting them out of our country or we're going to incarcerate. Freedom is back in style. Welcome to the revolution. We burning down the night, shooting bullets at the moon, baby. This is how we Sean Hannity. The new, the new Sean Hannity Show. More behind-the-scenes information on breaking news and more bold, inspired solutions for America. Stay right here for our final news roundup and information overload. Can you name for me, Don, one white nationalist article at Breitbart? Just one. Well, I saw he, that whole build-up segment. I didn't see a single white nationalist article. Not one. There is an article defending the alt-right, and also the alt-right praises Breitbart, and, and even he has said he is a platform for the alt-right. So why traffic in that if, if he doesn't support it? It's important to draw a distinction between covering something and defending something. We published an article several months ago explaining the alt-right, talking about which parts of it were more offensive, which parts of it were less so. And that's not defending the alt-right. That's explaining it. In fact, the title, I believe, was something like explaining the alt-right to mainstream conservatives. That's journalism. That's not defense or advocacy. So I think it's very important to understand the distinction between those two. And that's a distinction we made very clearly at Breitbart and still make today. You should read the entire article. I think the article stands for itself. I think it goes through the different components of the alt-right. It's called journalism. The New Yorker does it. The New York Times does it. CNN occasionally does it. Well, here's what my colleague uh, Anna Navarro tweeted this. She said, folks, it's real simple. Good, decent, inclusive Americans who believe in equality do not get praised by the American Nazi Party and the KKK. So the question is, why does President-elect Trump want Bannon in the White House? Well, let's put it this way. You have the new Black Panther Party praising Barack Obama. You have Obama sitting in Jeremiah Wright's church for 20 years, and he dissociated himself from none Jeremiah of those, Wright. No, so none I of think, those people were so advisors. So wait a second. You have to, if but you hold have on. To, hold on. No, he was if you're, a, if you're, you're asking right. me, If you're asking me mm -hmm. to be honest and fact check, none of those people were advisors to the president. He did not appoint any of those people. When you're he not applying office. the same standard to both people. Barack Obama was the president and came from this environment. Steve Bannon does not come from those environments. And Anna Navarro 
and Evan McMullen have both lied openly about Steve Bannon. They have both said he's an anti-Semite. Evan is on your show tonight. He can't defend that statement. Kurt Bardella sure didn't even try didn't even try to say whether Steve Bannon's an anti-Semite or not. So the entire premise of your discussion, Don, is Steve Bannon's an anti-Semite. I think we've proven that to be false because Evan can't defend it, Kurt can't defend it, I can't, Anna can't defend it, and it's not true. And I think that when you do this, this is what the media do, is what the establishment does. They throw out a bunch of innuendo to try to smear somebody. The most offensive thing Steve Bannon ever did was win the White House with Donald Trump. And if it was up to these people, it would be Hillary Clinton picking the Supreme Court and consigning our democracy to decline. And Steve Bannon deserves the praise of these folks, not their condemnation. The point of this discussion is whether Steve Bannon's a white nationalist and an anti-Semite. I'm glad that we've put that myth to bed. Now let's move on to talking about the country. I don't think we've put that myth to bed. I think that's still a question about it. Just because you say it, it doesn't mean that he's not. Um, and I don't know that he is, but he certainly, he certainly traffics in it when he says... He made a business of it. He, yes. He certainly did not. You guys can't throw out lies like that and ask me to prove a negative when you can't even prove the positive. I could say anything about you, Don Lemon. You know, your network had a commentator the other night who said that the vote for Donald Trump was a white lash. Now, are you a black nationalist network because Van Jones said that there was a white lash? I mean, that's just ridiculous. That's Shouldn't apples and pears. It's, you're, no, it's not. You're it's making the same a comparison. Thing. It's exactly the same thing. No wow. That was Joel Pollack. He's been a friend of mine for a long time. I've known Joel. He's the senior editor-at-large, in-house counsel at Breitbart News, and the author of the brand-new book, 19 Hard Truths That the Left Refuses to See, Hear, or Speak About. And he was on the Clinton News Network, and uh, and that's the way the Clinton News work rolls, and that they, they move forward with slander, smear, besmirchment, not only of Donald Trump, this entire campaign, but in this particular case, it was against Steve Bannon. What, one of the best parts of that debate, Joel, is when, you said, all right, give me one example of where Breitbart or Steve Bannon have have been, you know, either racist or anti-Semitic. And they couldn't give you an answer, could they? No. And that's the nature of this kind of allegation. It's just designed to marginalize and freeze the target in Saul Alinsky terms. They just throw that stuff out there. They feel no obligation to prove it. And that's what I showed is that they couldn't prove it, not even with one piece of evidence. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing. Now, you happen to be, and we're friends, so I know this, and, and you're very out there about your faith. You're an Orthodox. You're, you're Orthodox Jewish in your faith. You're, you, you absolutely follow, you know, strict adherence to the Sabbath. Is that correct? And, and all of these that's important right. things in your life, which, by the way, I admire is this is a country founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And so many other people, Pam Geller wrote me a note so angry the other day at how they're treating Bannon. And a number of other people of the Jewish faith, friends of mine, have written similar things because they feel this charge against Bannon is so unfair. And you have been probably the, the loudest, the most articulate voice in favor of Steve. And I want you to address what they're trying to do to him. Well, they're trying to make him toxic. And they're trying to do that so they can get to Donald Trump. And they're trying to get to Donald Trump so they can get to the 61 million people who voted for Donald Trump. You know, those 61 million people heard all of this stuff in August and September. All of these things were already said. This was all an argument that was had and it was ignored. And the 61 million people looked past all the nonsense and the political correctness and the innuendo, and they just went to the polls and voted for change. And now the media is trying to punish them for doing that. And they're Re regurgitating, recirculating all this stuff that has no basis whatsoever. And they're trying to deny the reckoning that has to come for the way they conducted themselves during this election. The media missed the story. They missed the anger. They missed the desire for change. Even Michael Moore was telling them, you're going to lose Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania unless you listen. It's amazing. Michael Moore actually listed the state well in advance, and he was warning them. And you got liberals like Thomas Frank telling the media, hey, you guys have to learn a lesson. Stop talking down to people. Start listening to people. But they don't want to learn that lesson, so they want to relitigate, regurgitate everything that they tried during the election. And, you know, I say keep doing it, because if you wanted to unify conservatives, this is the way to do it. Well, 
Look, I got to tell you something. I just think that nobody saw this coming. Do you know how many people said to me that, yeah, you know, the day after Election Day, Hannity, your career's over. You're done. You're finished. And I said, well, maybe it is. But people said that in 2008 and 2004 and 2012 and in 2000. So I guess I, I guess I must be doing something consistently right, because I think I was pretty dead on in my predictions about how bad Obama would be as a president. And I always said that Donald Trump can win. Yes, he can. I'd say it's not easy. The electoral map is never easy for a Republican. But the reason he won is because I regurgitated every day what the reason was. Americans out of work, in poverty, on food stamps, uh, that can't get jobs and can't advance their lives. And government has become the hugest obstacle in their lives. And then this... This was as big a choice election, maybe even bigger than Carter and Reagan. We'll find out in the end. Who knows? So I I think, you know, and Steve Bannon, to his credit, played a very big part, as well as Kellyanne and as well as, you know, everybody around Donald Trump in in structuring the message to what I call the forgotten man and the forgotten women. Those people that the 50 million in poverty, the 50 million on food stamps, the 95 million out of the labor force. That's what this election to me was all about. That's right. And. You know that because you talk every day to the listeners of this show and you hear their concerns and and you debate people who disagree with you and and you have your finger on the pulse. Most journalists don't. And I was on the traveling press plane with Donald Trump for the last two weeks and I would wander into the crowds at these rallies and people didn't know I wrote for Breitbart. They just saw I was with the press. And people, especially women, would come up to me and they would grab my elbow and say, stop ignoring us. Stop ignoring us. I'm a college-educated woman. I'm a business owner. I'm a mother. I'm supporting Donald Trump, and I'm a smart person, and you guys keep demeaning us. And they really felt like the media was not listening to them. And the media really wasn't. I mean, at the last big rally, or second-to-last one in New Hampshire the night before Election Day, Donald Trump read a letter that he got from Bill Belichick saying what a great guy he was or whatever. And then he went into a speech which was historic because it was the first time a Republican presidential candidate was appealing directly to the working class of America, telling them that they were going to strike back. What did the media fixate on? They didn't talk about his words to the working men and women. They talked about Bill Belichick and was the letter real and could it have been written differently? And and they missed completely what Donald Trump was telling the voters. The Bill Belichick stuff was sort of decoration. The real message was, we're going to take our country back. They didn't report that part, and that's why it surprised them 24 hours later. Yeah. Well, I think that we now have a media in wait. And the wait is, is there on. Remember when Dan Quayle was appointed as vice president, they went on their infamous quail hunt and and their goal was to smear and slander this guy. By the way, very decent man, hardworking, successful, but they didn't want to hear it. So, you know, it's very funny because like this little pipsqueak that works over at CNN, Brian Stelter, you know, he tweets out and he sends a message. Media accessibility was a winning strategy for Trump in the primaries. How about trying it again now as president elect? And I I tweeted back. I said, hey, uh, pipsqueak, why should at real Donald Trump ever go on CNN again? CNN gave at Hillary Clinton debate questions and they colluded with the DNC about what questions to ask Donald Trump, Ted Cruz and Carly Fiorina. And now if I'm Donald Trump's campaign or now President elect Trump's transition team, I'm looking at the revelations of the New York Times. I'm looking at the revelations about CNN and CNBC and NBC and MSNBC and the Boston Globe and basically every other major media outlet. And my attitude is, why should he? He should transcend the media. Do what he did during the election. Go on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Go on shows that will actually allow him to give a full answer. And, you know, he doesn't need these people anymore. The world has been transformed. There is a media revolution going on before their very eyes, and they're just not in tune to it, apparently. Well, and he wouldn't be the first, by the way. We had President Obama going to YouTube stars and Zach Galifianakis and all this kind of alternative media stuff. So there's certainly a precedent for that. But look, some of these journalists that I met and got to know are, are nice people. But there's also a narrative that they work within which just shuts out the other side in many cases. And there are exceptions. There there are some good journalists out there who really get the story. But overall, the narrative controls everything in the media. And the focus at all of these Donald Trump events was much more on what are you going to trip on now? I want you to listen to this montage that we found. I mean, because it just shows how god-awful they were and how absolutely flawed they are. Listen to this. This will blow your mind. Donald Trump, just last week, he confirmed to the National Review that he is again considering a run in 2016. Do it. Do it. 
Donald Trump has been saying that he will run for president as a Republican, which is surprising since I just assumed he was running as a joke. Is that people think that Donald Trump is a clown. Do Donald, Donald Trump is a clown. I mean, does anybody seriously think that Donald Trump is serious about running for president? Donald Trump, you know, he's a clown. Which Republican candidate has the best chance of winning the general election? Of the declared ones right now, Donald Trump. <laughs> President Obama will go down as perhaps the worst president in the history of the United States, exclamation point, at real Donald Trump. <laughs> well, at real Donald Trump, at least I will go down as a president. So basically, this is the beginning of the end for Trump. The beginning of the end. The beginning of the end? This is probably starting of the beginning of the end for, for Donald Trump. Donald, uh, you're not going to be able to insult your way to the presidency. The strongest person usually isn't the loudest one in the room. So right now we have Hillary's about a 75 or an 80 percent favorite. We have different versions of the forecast you can look at. Poll has Hillary Clinton up by double digits nationally, 12 points, 50 to 38, four-way race. Clinton leading in Florida, Clinton leading in North Carolina, Clinton leading in Ohio, Clinton leading in Nevada. I could go on and on and on. Uh, I continue to believe Mr. Trump will not be president. And so, right now, Mr. Trump, to answer your call for political honesty, I just want to say, you're not going to be president, all right? It's been fun. It's been great. I love you. But, but, but come on, come on, buddy. We have a major projection right now. Donald Trump will take Ojai. And CNN projects Donald Trump will carry the state of Florida. Huge win for Donald Trump. Donald Trump, while we project, will win in Kentucky, in Indiana, with its 11 electoral votes. West Virginia, Florida, Tennessee, Mississippi, South Carolina, Alabama, North Dakota, uh, with its three electoral votes, and South Dakota, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, the state of Montana, both. North Carolina, Georgia, Iowa, Utah, Wisconsin, Arizona, Kansas with its six electoral votes, Nebraska with its five electoral votes, and Wyoming with its three electoral votes. Sorry to keep you waiting, complicated business. A lot of people have laughed at me over the years. Now they're not laughing so much, I'll tell you. It's so good, isn't it, Joel? I'll give you the last word because I think this is what we're going to expect when every appointment is uh, announced. I think that whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you can enjoy that montage because it's about somebody who gets picked on, bullied and made fun of coming back and proving that they can do it and they can succeed. And there's something really American about that. And I hope everybody can take heart from that. All right, Joel, I, uh, I appreciate you shedding some light. You know, the charge of racism, anti-Semitism is so awful. It is so God awful. Nobody would ever want it. And that's why liberals and the left do it all the time. And that's what that's absolutely, to me, unreal. Love your work, sir. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Hannity Headlines. A bite-sized version of the show that you can take with you anywhere you go. To sign up today for Hannity Headlines, go to Hannity.com. More of the best of the Sean Hannity Show coming up. A time for choosing. This election, you decide if America lives or dies. Only five days till Election Day, 800 941 Sean. If you want to be a part of the program, the state I've been most worried about, even as I look at early voting and uh, absentee vo voting numbers every day, I've decided not to share it with you. Although the trends, generally speaking, look very good, especially compared to the 2012 model. And usually Republicans win on Election Day over Democrats. So, you know, there are numbers that I, I like that I'm looking at that give me some confidence that there's, this is going to be an interesting election. But I don't have the confidence that I've gotten a 270 votes in my head. I don't know to the extent, knowing we have a corrupt media, that we're ever going to get the, the true story of what has now gone on here. As it relates to Hillary Clinton, 
And now a 99 percent certainty that five foreign intelligence agencies, in fact, did hack into that unsecure server of hers. And the fact that the Clinton Foundation pay to play issue has now been investigated at a high level for now a full plus year. And that agents now are so disgusted with the Department of Justice that they've decided to bypass them and are giving the public information that shows that, in fact, that they, in the end, will likely be pushing for an indictment. It's unbelievable how corrupt this whole thing is. What it would mean is if, God forbid, Hillary's ever elected, that this country would remain paralyzed for however long she is in that office. That means we won't be solving our economic problems. We won't be dealing with anything of substance on the national security front. We won't be vetting refugees. We won't be balancing budgets. We won't be eliminating Obamacare. We won't be fixing education. We won't be building a wall, and we won't be becoming energy independent. Anyway, there's a really good um, candidate, somebody I've come to know and love, and he's an American hero. Uh, Brian Mast is with us, and he's going for your Allen West old district, right? This is uh, Yeah, this is where Allen West uh, was unfortunately defeated by Patrick Murphy, who's running against Marco Rubio for the Senate down here now. He left his seat open, right. and I'm going to take it. Well, I want you to take it. I support you in your effort to take it. How are things looking in the polls for you down where you are? It's going very well. You know, polling, uh, whatever you want to stock you want to put into it, it's got me up maybe four, five, six points. It's a tough race. I'm going up against a self-funder, but... Uh, his money has not bought him this race, even though, uh, you know, he's done his best to do so. Uh, but, you know, you're talking about the right things. You know, we're facing, a, unfortunately, a president who could not be more corrupt. I mean, she sold America out to the highest bidder. We can't have her. Let me ask you this. Have you seen your early voting numbers, absentee voting numbers? How are they looking? Uh, you know, Florida is turning out. This is a record number of participants in early voting in Florida. We're going to have essentially 60 percent of the vote across the entire state already in before election day occurs and that's a record for florida yeah and republican turnout how is it compared to last the the last two election cycles it's up over the last two election cycles uh so we're seeing good numbers in terms of that it's exactly what we want to see here uh and it looks like things have settled and and we're going to see probably a trump victory throughout florida how do you feel about the Republican leadership now? Every exit poll in the presidential primary showed that there was a 65 percent betrayal feeling among Republicans against their party. Well, this is something that has occurred. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that we should excuse things that are said or done that are wrong for anybody. But that doesn't mean that, that you don't look in the mirror a little bit and say, OK, we have uh, you know flawed things within each of us. But we still have a candidate that represents the right things for this country, the right future for this country. No, you're I'm talking, talking about, about Iran, Republicans in Washington. Everything. I'm talking about Republicans in Washington. It shows up that they that Republicans felt betrayed by Washington Republicans. What does that tell you? And that's what I mean. We have to those that, that were not standing by Donald Trump. They need to find a way to still stand behind him, stand next to our candidate and say he's still representing. The well, right he's going to cut taxes for the future of this country. Look at the look at the differences. He'll cut taxes. Hillary will raise them. He'll say radical Islam. She won't. She'll increase refugees 650 uh, percent. He's going to extremely vet them, especially people from countries that grow up culturally with values that are the antithesis of our constitutional values. Um, you know, look, look at important issues um, like not only the economy, but also energy, education, securing the country and the wall and building the wall and, and competition, uh, eliminating Obamacare. These are such profound differences. And the Supreme Court is number one. Exactly. She'll give us more of the Iran deal. He won't. The list goes on and on and on. And that's what makes it an easy decision. Yeah. Well, listen, Brian, anything we can do to help you, uh, for those that are in this congressional district, it is on the east coast of Florida. I would want to urge everybody to get out there, vote and support somebody I think that will bring some strength and power to uh, to uh, the Congress, and they need a backbone for sure. And I'll deal with That's this on November 9th. All right, sir, thank That's you. It. I'll bring them some courage. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know what? You've shown courage your whole life. So it wouldn't. Uh, we need that courage. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, 800-941-SEAN is a toll-free telephone number. You want to be a part of the program. I don't know why New Kingrich, uh, our affiliate in Naples, Fort Myers, which is where I one day, if God lets me live long enough, would like to retire. And I have a, a condo down there. 
And I don't know why early voting numbers in Collier Lee counties are not as good as they should be. So if you're listening to Fox News Radio 92.5 and you have not yet gone out to vote, you need to get out there. I mean, this is a county literally that needs to overwhelm and make up for some of the more liberal parts of the state. Also, that I-4 uh, corridor, Orlando through Tampa, is so crucial to the state of Florida. And those of you up in the Panhandle and Jacksonville areas, you're important too. And all you New Yorkers that moved down to the eastern part of Florida, uh, the southeastern part of Florida, you know, the Palm Beach area, you know, look what all your liberal values in New York got you. Don't ruin another state, the great state of Florida. Good grief. That would be frustrating. I don't care. Listen, if you live in New York, New Jersey, any of these states, Illinois, California, and you want to get out because of confiscatory taxes, abuse of regulation, that's fine. And you want to retire to a state that's affordable like Texas or Florida, that's fine. Or the Carolinas, that's fine. But don't bring your liberal values that destroyed your state with you. It's unbelievable. You know, well, we destroyed one state. Now let's retire and go destroy another. After all, we have to move out because we can't afford to live in the state that we grew up in. And that happens all the time. Linda's shaking her head. Yeah, I'm, am I right? If, you're, if you come from a liberal state and you've always voted liberal, California, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, okay, then you're saying, I can't afford to live here anymore. The taxes are too high. I'm going to be on a limited income, a fixed income. So, oh, I think I'll go to the Carolinas. I think I'll go to Texas. I think I'll go to Florida. Uh, fine, but don't bring the same voting patterns with you that destroyed the states you're coming from. Anyway, uh, is that my buddy Ami Horowitz calling in? Ami, what's going on, my friend? What's up, Sean? How are you, buddy? What are you up to now? You must have done something. I did. I did. But, uh, but a, a nice, safe, and sound video. I know. I, I always had the feeling that liberal elites had disdain and hatred for their own constituency, particularly the you know, black people. So I went to Berkeley, California, and I asked liberals there, what's wrong with voter ID laws? And their answers, which should shock every single black person who's looking to vote for Hillary Clinton today. Every single person said they're not smart enough to get on the Internet and to renew it. They can't find the DMVs. They don't carry IDs. The amount of disdain and hatred they had for their own constituency was disgusting. Then I went to Harlem, and I asked black people what they think about these white people, and they were shocked. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe the way they were looked at by the people that they're looking to support politically. And it should be a message to all black people. They should not be supporting any Democrats at all. All right, let's play what you got here. I'm Ami Horowitz, and I'm here in Berkeley, California, to find out if voter ID laws suppress the black vote. Do you have an opinion on voter ID laws? Uh, yeah, they're usually pretty racist and <laughs> they're bad. I think voter ID laws are a way to perpetuate racism. The type of people don't live in areas with easy access to DMVs or other places where they can get identification. You can always get IDs um, you do over the internet. They think that's harder for black people to go online. Well, IDs. I feel like they don't have the knowledge of how, of like, how it works. For most of the communities, they don't really know what is out there just because they're not aware or like right. they're not informed. I also think there's a repression of like black voting with um, how they, how if you're a convicted felon, like you're not allowed to vote and everything. And when you look at swing states like Florida, that's a huge population of the, of the like African Americans. Now I'm here in East Harlem to ask black people their thoughts on what you just heard. Do you have ID normally? You carry ID around? Yes, I have state ID. Do you carry ID? Yes, I do. Do you know anybody, who, any black person who doesn't carry ID? No. Everyone that I know has an ID. Why would they think we don't have ID? <laughs> That's a lie. Why would you say that? Do you have ID? Yes. Because I have my ID and my friends have their ID, so like, we know what we need to carry around. See, everybody that I know have ID. Like, that's one of the things you need to walk around with New York with, an ID. Do you know any black adult who does not have ID? No, I don't. Is it a weird thing to even say that? Yes, it is. What is this, some, some type of uh, trick candy camera? I know, like that? right? <laughs> That's the only thing I brought with me. Those legit, yeah. legit IDs. I heard a lot also that uh, black people can't figure out how to get to the DMV. Really? Is that, is that, is that, what does that say to you? I know it's that. It's on 25th Street. Do you know where the ID, the, the DMV is around you? It's on 125th Street and 3rd Avenue, I believe. You know how to get there? Yeah. Did you have a problem getting there if you had to get there? No. 
it's I know these sound like silly questions. You know how to get the DMV? Of course. You know where it is? Yes. You can get there? Uh-huh. No problem. No problem. Just checking. Okay. And I also heard a lot that black people, especially poor black people, have no access to the internet, can't figure out how to use the internet. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's just stupidity, honestly. Everybody has access to the internet. Even a little kid can figure out how to work the internet. I had access to the internet for years. Know how to use it properly, right? Exactly. I do it at work. <laughs> so, of course, I know how to use it. Smart. My kids know how to use it. They all have iPads, iPods, whatever. Your phone has data? Mm-hmm. You can actually Unlimited. With, unlimited data. Mm-hmm. I use my phone as a hotspot. What does that say to you for the people who have this perception of black people? Um, uh, they're pretty much ignorant. Uh, that's what my thought process on. I just think that's ignorant. It's ignorant. Ignorant. That's the word. Very, I'm very a lot. ignorant. I- ignorant. It's very, very ignorant. Does it sound racist for somebody to say that? I, I think it is a little racist because you know you're putting um, people in a category and you have no idea what you're talking about. Maybe a little bit. All of right, racist let me step in, in here because we're running out of time. I want to get some calls in here. So, what, what's your conclusion? To all of this. The conclusion is this: this unholy relationship between the black community and and the liberal elites is something which has not helped the black community for years. And this is a perfect example of it. You see the absolute disdain they have for black people and liberal elites. And they need to come to Republicans who have real solutions for their problems. Not to mention the fact that, you know, obviously Trump has been talking about uh, fraud in this election. There's a reason why we need voter ID. And black people, by the way, have no problem with voter IDs. They have IDs. They have no issue with it. Again, it's the liberal elites who are the only ones... So you think, that you, th- you think the basic idea is to get illegal immigrants an opportunity to vote? Oh, there's, no, there's no question about it. Of course, of course that's, the, that's, their, that's their game plan. Absolutely. Well, there's no doubt that black America has suffered under eight years of Obama's policies. At a, at a 58 increase, uh, a percentage increase of blacks on food stamps, 20% increase blacks out of the labor force, proves my point. They also are suffering lack of opportunity in inner cities. The worst schools in the country are in inner city America. Crime and violence in a city like Chicago is off the hook, out of control. 3,000 plus people dying since Obama's been president. Nearly 4,000. It's unbelievable. Over 3,000 shot this year alone. And what has he done? Nothing. All right, Ami, appreciate it. Thank you. Back to our busy uh, telephones uh, as we say hi to Judy is in Auburn, Alabama. Alabama. What's going on? Hi, Sean. Real quick, Judy, we got a minute. Okay, um, hey, Trump could move way ahead if he would just come right out now, tonight, on, and just say if he would name Ted Cruz for his number one choice for Supreme Court. Ted Cruz is actually out so campaigning with my – I give Ted Cruz a lot of credit. Ted Cruz had more reason than anybody else to be angry at Trump. It got very personal between the two of them. And I've always liked Ted Cruz. He's out there campaigning with Mike Pence today. I'm I know pretty that. Happy and, and we – we just love Ted Cruz, and, and it would be the best of both worlds if we could have a Trump president and a Cruz Supreme Court justice. Uh, I actually I second the motion. I'd pick Cruz in a heartbeat. Love Cruz in the, on the Supreme Court. It'd be great that you're not going to have any chance of that with Hillary as president. I'll tell you that. Anyway, thank you, Judy, for a good call. Appreciate it. Eight hundred nine four one. Sean, our number. I'm saying it. I've been saying it. Okay. Don't be afraid. We are going to bring our country back. You know, Democrats would be better off if they ran Oprah uh, or Tom Hanks. Or why don't we run beloved people? Democrats have have become, to uh, to, to a lot of Americans, a boutique party of of fake outrage and social engineering. And they're not entirely wrong about that. Freedom is back in style. Welcome to the revolution. We burning down the night. Behind-the-scenes information on breaking news and more bold, inspired solutions for America. It is important for families that are anxious. It is important for children and adolescents that are unsure because of Tuesday to understand that the city of Chicago is your home. You are always welcome in this city. Always. To be clear about what Chicago is, it always will be 
a sanctuary city. To all those who are, after Tuesday's election, very nervous, there's filled with anxiety has been spoken to, you are safe in Chicago. You are secure in Chicago, and you are supported in Chicago. The city continues will provide services, and your ability to access those services will always be there. They will not waver or change because of administration. They may change, but our values do not. This is a city of inclusion. And while you are here and you call Chicago home and you call yourself a resident of the city of Chicago, your legal status does not determine whether your kids can go to school. Your legal status does not determine whether you can access public services. And this is a representative of what it means to be a community of support. You are safe, you are secure, and you are supported in the city of Chicago. Here we are. And which Republican candidate has the best chance of winning the general election? Of the declared ones right now, Donald Trump. I especially like. Well, what about the, of all of them? I mean, the Scott fake Walker. Laughter from the audience. Um, <laughs> Scott Walker, would you say? Of, of the, the ones who aren't declared, no, I'm Romney Walker's my ticket. Romney Walker. So you, but last time you were, you said if we elect, if we nominate Romney, we'll definitely lose. And I was right. But um, <laughs> well, why will he win this? That was two third years times the in charm? advance, and it was because actually four. Of, well, it was third time. Time was the charm for Reagan. Right. Um, it was because it's very hard to take out an incumbent, and the reason I supported Christie back then, and I don't now, um, was because you know he's so flashy and and idiosyncratic. That, we probably were going to lose, but the only shot we had was this wild, idiosyncratic guy. I think um, Romney I want, would crush Hillary. I would do anything for Though Trump. Though if you ran, Christie. Trump. Christie. If you ran Bernie Sanders, it would be much tougher. <laughs> Bernie Sanders. It would be much tougher to beat him. Than Hillary. You think would be a better candidate than Hillary? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, because he, he would cares excite about the, base. the American middle or the right. middle class working class. Hillary does, and she's like the Ooh. elected Republican. She cares about the Chamber of Commerce. Ooh. Ooh. All right, there you have Rom Rombo Deadfish Emmanuel and his pathetic pledge that he's going to violate the rule of law, which is great. When Trump then brings back the rule of law, rescinds the executive amnesty, illegal, unconstitutional executive amnesty, and he goes forward with the city breaking the law. Then they're going to pay a huge price. And then, of course, the president actually, I think, believes that he's going to influence Donald Trump, which is not going to happen. And then the best cut, I think, of the entire election season, Ann Coulter, back in 2015, I don't remember the exact date, I think it was June of 2015, saying to Bill Maher and being scorned and mocked and ridiculed and laughed at, that Donald Trump very well could win the presidency. And Coulter joins us now. And Trump we trust. She now is having her last laugh. That is so, so, that is what I call getting in last licks in a major way. Well, I'm happy about the result. That was two days after Trump's announcement. And uh, I was waiting for what we've seen so many times before, for a politician to take a sensible position on immigration, um, the entire the entire establishment, the media establishment, the political establishment, both political parties, Hollywood, all of those businesses, Macy's, The Apprentice, NBC, r- rose up against Trump, and we've seen it time and time again where politicians would back down. Marco Rubio ran for Senate, promising not to, to support amnesty. As soon as he gets to the Senate, what's he pushing? Amnesty. So that was two days after Trump's announcement, and at that point, Romney was the best we ever had on immigration until the mighty Trump. Uh, it took me about two weeks to see that, wow, Trump isn't backing down um, to say pretty clearly that he would be the nominee, and I thought I thought would win the presidency. You know, a lot of people are trying to make the case, oh, look, at he put Steve Bannon in there. You know, as Mark Levin said, as our friend David Horowitz said, as Joel Pollack have said, these are all people that actually really know Steve Bannon. You have known him. I know him. This this false narrative just shows me that the media that tried to assassinate Donald Trump's character and were all in the tank for for Hillary, they're now they haven't learned a thing and they're back to their same old tricks 
which, by the way, has now been rejected by the American people. Yes, exactly right. We've just gone through 16 months with the media calling Trump Hitler. I believe every single op-ed columnist at the New York Times at one point or another in the past year had a brilliant think piece on the comparisons between Donald Trump and Adolf Hitler. Um, and it didn't work, so now they're trying it with his aide. I, you know, I'd never heard of it, and I'm sure you haven't. Nobody had heard of this alt-right until, until Donald Trump was running, but um, now having discovered um, these teenagers, <laughs> they're really leading the way and taunting the media and the liberals and their position i think they're leading us the way out of this by just saying no actually it's fun to be called a racist (laughs) yeah you know well i gotta tell you the only reaction to this nonsense i don't want to hear anyone going on tv and somberly telling us that steve bannon is not an anti-semite is not a racist how about screw you i kind of like your attitude culture i think the days of republicans apologize Apologizing, 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 apologizing for the for the built in phony narrative. Could you you know, look, if Donald Trump follows through on his agenda, I have I have an addendum to his tax plan and I have an idea for his education plan. Tell me if you like it. You know, Did he's going to mention the penny plan. I'm flying to New York. Oh, shut up. You. Well, you just shut up. Well, that would be a good idea, by the way. But I'm not talking about that. I want gonna... to get to that immigration. Can I just can I can I can I ask the question? So he's going to repatriate trillions. He's going to have a 15 percent corporate tax cut. The repatriation tax is going to be 10 percent, which is really low, which means a lot of money can be brought in. But if he added an incentive that it'd only be seven and a half percent tax, if you invest in the cities that need it most. And when he says here's education going back to the states, he should go into major cities with predominantly black communities and say the days of horrible education for your children is now over. Right. Okay. But one thing I want to say about the sanctuary cities is um, just first on the general point, then on the specifics, and that is it really is such a ratchet effect with these liberals. Um, They win in in completely illegitimate ways, rulings from the Supreme Court for abortion, for gay marriage, although there's no mention of abortion and gay marriage in the Constitution. And the next day you have gays showing up at that Kentucky um, clerk's office demanding that evangelicals um, hand over hand over marriage licenses. Meanwhile, rights that are actually in the Constitution, uh, the right to bear arms, Congress's authority over Im- immigration, the federal government's authority over immigration, the commander in chief's duty to guard the the, the borders and. <laughs> Try to. I mean, we've had the Heller ruling on on guns. What was that? Five, six, seven years ago. Google that for me. It was a long time ago. Try to get a gun in California. You still cannot get one, and I would submit to you. I bet you can't get one in Illinois. Um, immigration. This is expressly uh, the duty of Congress to 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 issue rules governing the admittance of people. It is expressly the duty of the Commander in Chief uh, to guard our borders. That is the job of the Department of Defense, um, which is why these appointments are. Very, very important. Everyone forgets Department of Defense. Hmm. Listen to that name. Defense. What does that mean? It means defend America. It does not mean defend Germany. We ought to bring all those troops home from over 100 countries around the world and set them to work building the wall. Even the most extravagant um, estimates of how much a border wall will cost amount to less than 5% of the Department of Defense's entire budget. This is why every one of these appointments being made right now matters. I would love love to see Senator Sessions as defense secretary. We need someone who cares about defending America and not defending the Ukraine and, you know, various other countries that hate us around the world. As for how he can, um, how Trump, a Trump administration, also HUD is going to be important. All of this money that pours into especially overspending states like Illinois and California, which is where a lot of these sanctuary cities are, and New York, Illinois and California are headed straight for bankruptcy like a bullet train because of those teachers' union pensions. Um, not only will Congress, under Republican hands, they would be insane to bail out these overspending states and make nice states like Tennessee, Alabama, Michigan pay for the overspending of California. Um, but, but you can, of course, withhold federal funding. Um, they can't just violate federal law like this, and no serious judge would uphold these sanctuary cities. You know, i got to tell you, the most important thing for me now is that the Republicans get out of the way realize that it's Trump that won the election. They didn't win Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. He did. And I I actually worry about the Mitch McConnells and Paul Ryans of the world and whether or not they will undermine the Trump agenda or try and water it down. 
I agree with you. I don't know about – I think McConnell is – We'll see. I think he's smarter, and I hope he, they have all gotten the message immigration is a bigger issue than they thought. Every problem is solved with immigration. It's interesting. There are a lot of things Donald Trump was the first for, um, the first to do as a presidential candidate. Certainly as a Republican, he's the first one to say, we're not cutting entitlements. Um, you know what would go a long way to shoring up Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid? Getting, getting illegal immigrants off of it. Getting the parents of H-1B visa holders off it. No, these are plans meant to support Americans when they fall on hard times or when they become elderly. Um, the, the, the job situation, the, the black youth unemployment rate, how about we get them to work building a wall, building bridges. Um, there is going to be so many, so many wonderful things. Every problem is made better by a moratorium on immigration and building a wall. You know, all of that, I think, and I, I kind of get a kick out of you when you say, you did a column recently and you said, this is Trump's agenda. How many items on the agenda were there? Well, the first hundred days, I had a detailed right. uh, schedule for him. And, and what was day one? Start building the wall. What was day two? Continue building the wall. What was day 100? Report to public on building of wall. Continue building wall. And 99, day 99? Hang on, let me check my notes. Work Continue your way building back. building wall. Oh, so, but I agree with you. And also I would argue that it's time to do it. Were you at all worried when he said, well, some parts of the wall may be a fence, depending on where they are, but I'm building the wall? <laughs> oh, good grief, no. You know what this reminds me of? Remember... Uh, when the media lured George Bush the first into re breaking his pledge, that outrageous breach with the American people. I mean, for 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 the youngsters listening, when um, the the first Bush who had who had only got a, only was elected because it was supposed to be Reagan's third term, promised at the Republican National Convention not to raise taxes. He actually predicted how the Democrats would come to him. This was in his speech. They'll come to me and they'll say, we really need to raise taxes to, 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 to you know, kill the deficit. We'll trade you this. And he kept saying, and I'll say to them no. I'll say to them no. And finally it was, and I'll finally say, read my lips. No new taxes. Famous line. And what does he do? Gets into office and raises taxes. And the reason I mentioned that was the, the New York Times during that period and all media were so hilarious. They lure Trump, um, Bush into doing it, saying, oh, well, he's got to do the responsible thing, got to do the response. He's got to raise taxes if he's a seer, if he's going to be the adult in the room. And then he raises taxes and they all attack him for flip-flopping. That's exactly what the media is doing now. They are so desperate to lure Trump into violating one of his pledges, one of the big ones. There are only three or four that he absolutely cannot go back on. The wall, deporting illegals, and it doesn't have to be done overnight. He's given us the order, the pecking order of how he'll deport them. Um, renegotiating trade deals, um, the, I mean, and not starting a pointless war. Those are the big ones. If he betrays us on those... Um, they'll impeach him, and there will be nobody to defend him. As long as he fulfills those, and I absolutely believe he will, um, as I did since about two weeks after his announcement speech, if he does those, he can shoot anybody on Fifth Avenue, and, and the American people will have his back. And I will also predict to you that he will get even more of the black vote in his re-election run because he is go he's – one thing I've noticed, um, people have to go on TV and say something. Uh, they can't just stand there and stare at, or sit there and stare at the, at the camera. So they all start saying the same things, even when they're manifestly insane. And one of the ones they were all saying this, this year was, well, when Trump appeals to African-American voters, he doesn't really want their vote. He's trying to get the votes of suburban women. Um, no, actually, I think he really wants the votes of African-Americans. Um, he, is, he has been absolutely said everything I've always wanted a Republican candidate to say. I think he's going to do it. I think he's going to bring back so many jobs and be so good for all Americans, but especially the working class and the middle class. Those, um, are, the, those are the people that matter America. to me. I don't care about all these people in Washington. I want to see those people get their jobs back. Too many Americans yes. have been suffering for too long. I call this the forgotten man election, and the forgotten man stood up and said, I'm sick of it. Thank God. Yes. And by the way, Ann, you, uh, you were really out front in all of this. I, I give you a lot of credit. as Thank uh, you. Well, I tell you when you're a pain in my neck, so I, I've got to <laughs> tell you when I like what you do. But this is what you were dead on, and uh, thank you for uh, always being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Good to talk to you, Sean. Bye-bye. Hannity Headline, a bite-sized version of the show that you can take with you anywhere you go. To sign up today for Hannity Headlines, go to Hannity.com.
More of the best of the Sean Hannity Show coming up. A time for choosing. You decide if America lives or dies. Did you wipe the sir? What, like with a cloth or something? I don't know. But we turned over everything that was work-related. Every single thing. Personal stuff, we did not. I had no obligation to do so and did not. Have you or any of your advisors heard from uh, Comey or anyone else at the FBI today? And are you concerned at all that these new emails that they say they've found will in any way reveal classified information that you sent or received? No, I, I, we have not been contacted by anyone. Uh, first, we knew about it is, I assume, when you knew about it, when uh, this letter uh, sent to Republican uh, members of the House was released. So we don't know the facts, which is why we are calling on the FBI to release all the information uh, that it has. Uh, even Director Comey noted that this new information may not be significant, so let's get it out. Understanding the magnitude of what is in play here, I, I don't think most Americans get <clears throat> excuse me, the full picture. Emails show Podesta links to Justice Department, official playing a key role in the, in the UMA probe. Wow, kept me out of jail. Okay, so they understood the significance on a very deep level of everything that we're talking about here. I want to walk through all of this with you. Larry Kawa is with us, and he understands this as well, if not better than anybody else. He actually, as a private citizen, took it upon himself to file a freedom of information request and pursue the truth about Hillary's scandals. He has a website, HillaryForPresident.com. On the website, they expose the secret issues of Hillary and her staff. And I think one thing that Larry's done better than anybody else is provide the documents that reveal her lies and her crimes. And one FOIA request did get Kawa more than he expected. And as the Clinton email scandal gained momentum, this started back, remember, in March of 2015, he sought her OF-109 form. I mentioned this yesterday in relation to Uma Abedin. She had signed this. This is a form sort of a separation agreement when you're working for the government that certifies that the departing State Department employee no longer possesses at all or has access to at all any classified information, that it has all been turned over. Now, this is where Uma Abedin now finds herself in a bit of a quandary because she didn't hand over all of these emails. Uma should, according to the law, be going to jail. Whether or not she flips state's evidence... Turns on her old employer. Oh, by the way, what did her employer call them? One of my employees, Uma, the all-important Uma Abedin, by her side, you know, holding her up, propping her up in some cases, now is just referred to as one of my employees by Hillary Clinton. Anyway, so eight months later, the agency did send him the documents that he hadn't even asked for. It's self-indicative, he says, of how disorganized the Freedom of Information request process actually is, but among them were non-disclosure agreements governing the handling of classified information. By signing these, Clinton and all the other people associated with this were acknowledging they could be guilty of a crime if, in fact, they exposed classified information or failed to return it at the end of their employment, both of which I would argue here, and I think Kawa agrees with me on this, she did by using a private email server, not turning it over when she left the agency. Now, Kawa's also noticed signatures missing from other parts of the form, including a box that acknowledges a security briefing, which he argued was evidence of Clinton's negligence on matters of national security. And remember, she said she couldn't remember 39 times. And remember, she actually claimed she didn't even remember being briefed because of a concussion that she had suffered. Anyway, the Daily Caller has made their own push for information on this. You've got to give some of these guys credit. They've been working for a year on this. Larry Kawa is one of them. And, uh, sir, welcome back to the program. I I wanted you to tell your story because, I mean, you're deep in the weeds in this, and I don't think the average person, I think they get what I'm telling them. I think I break it down to its basic parts as best I can, but I don't think the average person understands all the nuances you have discovered, and that's why I'm glad to have you back on the program. How are you? Thanks for having me back on, Sean. I'll start off by saying there are really two key points that I'd like to bring across today. The first of which is about a device called the Datto hardware device, and the second is regarding the fact that Huma Abedin never had security clearance and that Hillary Clinton allowed her specific unauthorized access to national security information. So let me start with Datto. 
it began with a Benghazi FOIA that I had done, where I filed in Southern District of Florida Federal Court, represented by Judicial Watch. To the best of my knowledge, I am their only private client in recent years. I'm honored that they've taken on two of my cases now. The first one on the employer mandate, where we went to the Supreme Court, and it got stalled out with the... Uh, the passing of Justice Scalia. But in the case on Benghazi, it's very simple. We had asked for all of the communications between then-Secretary Clinton and everyone in the White House, including President Obama, for the day of and week after Benghazi. The case concluded with the Department of Justice and the Department of State saying they never discussed Benghazi. Now, we asked for all communications, emails, texts, anything in their possession. It is unimaginable that the Secretary of State and the President and everyone in the White House just ignored Benghazi for the day of and week after the attack. So uh, the bottom line is that we concluded our case with Judicial Watch and I agreeing that uh, the State Department didn't have anything in their information, in their uh, arsenal, their archives. And I did some research and noticed that there was a device by Datto. Datto was a company that was subcontracted to by Platte River Networks to back up everything, and I do mean everything, that Hillary Clinton ever had on her personal computer, on her personal cell phones. I want to, I want to, I want to slow you down here. Platte River sure. Networks. That they were the company that was hired. This is the mom and pop shop that had the server in the bathroom closet. You're saying they subcontracted Datto Inc. In other words, another company to back correct. up all of their. And I, are they in Connecticut? This company. They're in Connecticut. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. All right. So now the question, first question I have is, um, if they're sending, which we now know, classified information, even top secret information and even beyond top secret, the highest classification of top secret, which we know happened, were they authorized to handle this in any way, shape, matter, or form legally? Not only weren't they authorized, but neither was SECNAP, which is a Boca Raton-based company that did their cloud jacket, and uh, SECNAP did not have a FIPS-3 or EAL-1 clearance. There's there's uh, these two clearance levels of credentials you need in order to handle that information. Not only did they not have that, and I don't want to, again, get off the point, but believe it or not, Ron Posner, on the advisory board of, of SECNAP, was the CEO of eChina Cash, uh, which handled gas cards for, for China's largest state-owned enterprise called uh, Sinopec. And he had full access to all of Hillary Clinton's code word clearance and security passwords. He sat on both boards and clearly had both the means and, and motivation to share national security secrets specifically with Uncle China. So there were three companies involved, just to be clear. Platte River which subcontracted to Datto to do the backup on their cloud, the Datto cloud, not the iCloud, a cloud just system of servers, and then SecNap, which did the firewall, also known as a cloud jacket, which, by the way, uh, from what I understand, has IRS violations and other violations uh, that you could discover in court in Palm Beach and Broward County, Florida, that just seems to be corrupt as, as can be. And obviously that's something you can research, but Datto is the key. And the reason why Datto did this backup without Hillary Clinton's knowledge and no one seems to really – if you Google it, you'll see this is true. They turned over the data where device containing everything before bleach bit and before hammers were swung at iPhones to the FBI in October of 2015. And the FBI shockingly never searched it. They've got it. They've had it for a year. Stop for a They've second. Stop, stop for one second here because this, sure. is, this is insane. What you're saying is that before – that the FBI has had for a year all 33,000 deleted emails. Are you sure? Come on. Are you sure? I know it sounds shocking, but uh, feel free to Google that. Oh, D-A-T-T-O, hardware device, Hillary Clinton. Whoa, did they ha the they device. handed it over to the FBI, the entire 33,000 deleted emails that were all backed up by the subcontractor of Platte River Networks, Data, Data Inc., has it and turned it over to the FBI. That's what you're telling me. Here, here's how sure I am. Uh, I discussed it at length with the lawyers at Judicial Watch since I had considered pursuing my case on Benghazi, but we mutually agreed a better direction would be to uh, to do a FOIA, serve a FOIA on the FBI, which they did uh, on my behalf on October 13th, and this FOIA was specifically requesting everything on the Datto device, and out of 3,000 FOIAs, by the way, that's how many Judicial Watch has done so far, it is the, uh, the first time they've ever asked for a rollout, to the best of my 
my knowledge, because typically FOIAs produce a few pages. We're expecting hundreds of thousands of pages of documents. No question they're going to need to litigate it. But really, the take-home point to the listeners is why in the world would the FBI not have searched this device? And also, why did they never issue a search warrant for the premises of someone who they thought violated national security procedures and protocol? There's no search warrant for Hillary Clinton's home, any of her residences, any of CGI or the foundation. They never issued a search warrant, and she never testified under oath. These are not the hallmarks of somebody that you're truly trying to thoroughly investigate. If you look at the timeline of all of this, which I think is very crucial here, the timeline is all of this was under subpoena and had to be turned over. Why didn't this particular Datto company feel the urge because they weren't subpoenaed individually? Who went and got No, they turned it over. Datto turned it over to the FBI. They, uh, the FBI identified its existence in August of 2015. Datto turned it over to the FBI uh, in October of 2015. It's well documented, but people are not well aware of it. But anyone who wants to do it, Google Datto hardware device, D-A-T-T-O. It exists. It's been in their possession. Uh, Judicial Watch lawyers uh, have agreed with me and did file that FOIA on my behalf in exchange for me ending my Benghazi case. And uh, they have moved forward. I I did not want to be the plaintiff on this case. And I've done many FOIAs on on my own, Sean. But this one is so damning. It is a political holocaust for the Democrats because let's remember... Everything on that Datto device contains uh, Hillary Clinton emails with Bill Clinton, President Obama, with the pseudonym that he used when he emailed an account he said that he didn't know exist. Let's remember there's 18 emails uh, between them. Uh, and all foreign leaders, uh, CGI and foundation donors, the uh, the, ha- the Haiti uh, corruption, it's all on there. Not only emails, tech photos, videos, captured voicemails, everything. It's, it's the entire kit and caboodle, and FBI just never searched it. It, it absolutely eclipses what you're going to find with Huma Abbott. It's just unbelievable the FBI never looked at it. It's, uh, it doesn't take your average genius, but somehow the FBI... Have you, have you recently contacted James bar. Comey's office to tell him it's there in his possession? I have filed I have filed an FBI on tips.fbi.gov. I have not heard from them. Uh, I, I did that with several different uh, pieces of information that I brought you. That's one of them. Uh, I filed a, a tip on Datto. I, t- I filed a tip on Huma Abedin not having security clearance. I filed a tip on SECNAP uh, lacking the appropriate... Uh, NISP credentials for uh, for accessing security clearance information, including the fact that uh, they had Ron Posner on their board and he's CEO of eChina Cash uh, that had access to China. I mean, to me, there's no question that there's been uh, sharing of national security secrets with other nations. And to our friends on the left, this is not a cyber glitch. This is not a technical error. This is sharing national security secrets that could endanger our lives and our, our troops in the field. That's how serious that this is. What do you now, think happens with UMA? Because UMA now is in deep trouble. UMA signed you know, that it, it, Form. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's very interesting, but uh, if you look on HillaryForPresident.com, my site, I, I just posted today breaking news. Uh, I did a FOIA, as you mentioned earlier, requesting Hillary Clinton's separation statement. Uh, I was, I thought that I had it. I get an email from the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Margaret Greyfeld, on Friday, November 13th, saying they accidentally released to me something that they shouldn't have, and uh, it wasn't for public consumption. I should return it. Twenty minutes later, I get a voicemail from State FOIA. Chief John Hackett saying the same thing, and uh, it, which, I, by the way, I've also posted on HillaryForPresident.com, so you can see this and actually hear the captured voicemail. Now, the point is that uh, I don't think that they were worried about something vague like social security numbers. They were worried that they accidentally screwed up and released her separation statement. And by the way, Daily Caller, uh, just after I did uh, a FOIA, they did the same FOIA, and they also had the same experience that something was released, and then it never came in the mail. So uh, the bottom line is there's well, an open senator investigation on mail tampering for, for that OF-109 or separation statement. But here's here's the take-home point for the listeners. Margaret Greyfeld, the Deputy Assistant yeah, Secretary real quick. of State, yeah. accidentally sent me uh, Hillary Clinton, Ahuma Abedin, and Cheryl Mills uh, NDAs for classified information. She sent me Huma Mills and uh, Huma, uh, excuse me, Huma Abedin and Cheryl Mills. All right, I'm going to give you some advice because you need to go to Jason Chaffetz. You need to go to Trey Gowdy. Oh, and I have spoken many times. And what about Trey Gowdy? Trey Gowdy. Have you talked to Trey? Trey Gowdy, Senator Johnson, and, and Senate HSGAC or Homeland Security Government. Well, why are we not? Why, well why is nobody following this bouncing ball? Because you've done more work as a private individual than, than the rest of the entire FBI combined, which is embarrassing. Sean, you'd have to ask Planet Congress. Uh, I, I could tell you that uh, I, I think that there is pressure from leadership on the House side that is disallowing them from moving forward. Uh, I can tell you on the Senate side, HSGAC may not be able to get the votes for subpoena powers in order to subpoena them because there are... All right, 
I, I, if I don't cut you off, it's going to be cut off anyway because I'm out of time. But, Larry, thank you for sharing it. Also, thanks for all the effort and time and, and diligence you put into this. We give you a lot of credit here. And uh, your website is HillaryForPresident.com, but it's not a pro-Hillary website, is it? Oh, no, it's, it's a gripe site, and you'll see all these documents. Yeah. I even posted a few videos. All right. Explain We're going to link things, it. Try to make them simple. We'll put Dr. Kawa's, what did you call it? What kind of site? A gripe site. A gripe site. We'll put a gripe yeah. site on, on my web, and we'll link it to your site, all right? I uh, at Hannity.com. Time once again, Sean. Thanks for your All right, buddy. Thank you. Quick break. Right back. We'll continue.